I'm here at the Film Fest Emden, and my guest today is the Canadian Canadian writer and director Christian Sparks. And you're here with two films, Sweetland and The King Tide. So let's start with Sweetland. Can you tell for our viewers, with just a few words, mm. what the film is about? Uh, it's about resettlement in small town Newfoundland, Canada. Um, you know, a lot of outport towns in Newfoundland are fishing villages. And when the fishery went away, there was no reason for these towns to exist. So the government was trying to pay all the residents to leave these towns and move to larger urban centers because it was too expensive to bring light and power and boats and services. Um, but the deal, so they pay all the residents of these towns $100,000 to leave, uh, but the deal only stands if everyone agrees. And there's one holdout in one town. It's an old man named Moses Sweetland. So it's about his resistance to change and trying to hold on to the town and the land and the life that he knows and loves. Okay. And what is the situation about these relocating now? Yeah, so resettlement is still happening in Newfoundland today. It was very big in the 1960s. Uh, the government forcibly rent, went around to small towns in Newfoundland trying to evacuate them. Uh, but now they don't do that as much because there was a lot of blowback, a lot of negative criticism of this. So now a town has to volunteer themselves and they have to approach the government and say, we want to be relocated. Will you pay us all to leave? Uh, and it doesn't, and even if there's one holdout now, um, they can still agree to take the package. But it used to be everyone had to agree. So we use that conceit for this story. Okay, so playing the role of Moses, you have Mark Lewis Jones, who has an impressive portfolio, mm -hmm. um, like Game of Thrones, for example. Mm -hmm. So he does an incredible job, and I couldn't think of anything, anyone else that, who would have done it better. So I didn't even realize that he was a Welsh actor until you mentioned it at the Q&A yes. a couple of days ago. So, he had so how did you find him? Uh, well, I knew I needed, um, you know, a really a world-class talent because the role of Moses, the character, is in every scene of the movie. And spoiler alert, for large portions of the movie, he's on his own. So I needed someone, a really dynamic, interesting presence that was going to hold the screen. And I wanted someone I thought maybe from Ireland or the UK because I wanted the Newfoundland accent to be right because it's such an authentic Newfoundland story. I was going to need that accent. And so UK thespian actors, they just have that talent and skill. Uh, so I spoke with a UK casting agency, and they recommended Mark, actually. He was one of our top two choices. And uh, luckily, we sent him the script, and he loved it. And he worked with the dialect coach for three months before filming to look, get the Newfoundland dialect down. So it was a, real, it was a dream to have him. Wonderful. And you shot the film on location in Newfoundland. And what, where exactly? We shot in a small town in Newfoundland uh, called Brigus South. It's about an hour outside of the capital, St. John's. And we had to do that because in an independent film, we have a tiny budget. And so any longer than an hour, you have to pay for hotels for the crew. You have to pay per diems for meals. So we wanted to keep it within the city limits. And so we stretched it as far as we could. And we found this beautiful little bowl of a town up the Southern Shore Highway in, uh, in Newfoundland. And it, it worked out perfect. But how hard was it to find that location? Uh, I was actually aware of the location because over the years I've done a lot of work for Newfoundland Tourism. I've directed a lot of the commercials. And a big part of that is traveling up and down the island, finding the most beautiful angles and most beautiful towns, waiting for the light to be nice and then shooting them. So I have a pretty good directory of Newfoundland towns in my, in my brain. And uh, so I always thought Brigga South was an option. And, Luckily, the townsfolk agreed to kind of help out and be a part of the film, and we had all the houses that we needed, so it worked out. Wonderful. Um, and you start the film by showing us how beautiful this place is. And in one scene, Moses can be seen with his nephew lying in the grass and saying, who's got it better than this? Mm -hmm. So that sums up perfectly why he didn't want to leave this place. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you, you changed the, the order of the scenes. Yeah, there's a beautiful scene with Moses and Jesse lying in the grass at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're just enjoying the beauty of the natural landscape. And that's a big part of what makes Newfoundland so great and what makes this town and the film so great. And, you know, by seeing them lying there and enjoying their lives and just the flowing grass and there's no fast pace, everything is slow down and bucolic. Um, it was important to establish that early so that the audiences knew what he was fighting for 
Originally in the scene, uh, the scene that precedes that in the movie, the government man shows up and says, the package is here, everyone wants to leave except for you, take the package. But I rearranged them and, and showed, uh, put the scene of Moses in the grass first so that the audience would understand what he has to lose when the government brand man brings up in the next scene, it would be clear. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the nephew, Jesse, is played by Cale Turner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, 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 the Jesse is autistic, and that's why Moses is afraid he will just willed on the mainland. Mm -hmm. um, in the end credits, I saw at least one logo of an autistic um, organization. Mm -hmm. So I guess you might have worked with them on portraying this character right. Yeah, I mean, representation was important for us. You know, in the novel, Jesse is autistic, and so we wanted to have an autistic child. We worked with the Autism Society of Newfoundland, hoping to find a Newfoundland child so we could get the accent and a child who understood the culture. But we couldn't find the right, we auditioned a bunch of kids, couldn't find the right one. And so then we worked uh, in conjunction with the Toronto casting director and put the call out across Canada. And on the opposite coast of the country, we found a little boy in a small town in British Columbia. His parents taped him on an iPhone and sent it in. He had never done anything before, but there was a real raw spark of talent there. So we flew him across the country and really fostered that, did some acting lessons, had him out fishing and hunting and getting a sense of what it's like to live in Newfoundland. And he had the, the time of his life. And for like a nine-year-old boy to cross the country on a plane, act in a movie with Mark Lewis Jones in his first role, pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, you definitely show a lot of love for Newfoundland. So I could see that throughout the film. Why is that so important to you? Well, the truth is Newfoundland is a, it's a beautiful, stark landscape. Uh, that uh, is just tucked away from the rest of the world and a lot of people don't know about Newfoundland. Even Canadians don't know fully about Newfoundland and Newfoundland's culture. So over the years, when I was younger, I couldn't get away from Newfoundland quick enough, go to bigger cities, see the world. But a funny thing happens in your 30s, you start looking back over your shoulder to where you come from. And coming back home and telling stories about Newfoundland and sharing that with the rest of the world has become kind of important to me. And it's been a signature of three of my four feature films now. And I absolutely love that. Yeah. And um, so you, how was growing up there? I mean, growing up in Newfoundland was amazing. I, I'm one of four boys. Um, I grew up in the 80s. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, the, the picture that Steven Spielberg paints in like the Goonies or uh, those early Amblin movies of kids outdoors all day, riding their bikes, getting into trouble, getting into adventures, that was exactly the kind of childhood that I had. I grew up next to a public park. Um, that is several miles long, full of woods. So you can imagine the amount of like shacks we built and we had fires in the woods and we were always getting up the, up the trouble, swimming in rivers and just out all day, all night. It was, uh, it was amazing. So let's get, let's get to the second film, The mm. King Tide. So can you again <coughs> briefly tell, you, tell us what it's about? Yeah, so The King Tide is another Newfoundland set story. It takes place in a remote town. There's a storm one night and um, all the power's knocked out and all the boats are flipped over in the harbor and a bunch of the townsfolk go down to check out the damage and they hear a baby crying and there's a baby trapped under the boat. So they rush to the boat and, and get the baby out from underneath and in the process one of the men injures his side and when he gets to the shore he looks down to his injury and it's, and it's suddenly healed and so we realize that this baby has magic healing powers. Um, and so the town, realizing that they've been given this beautiful gift, this immortality that this child provides, they cut themselves off from the rest of the world, and they live in paradise with no illness and no death for 10 years. And uh, they're living great, but they're starting to abuse the girl's power. They're starting to take it for granted. And one day when they uh, are, are, are misusing her power, another little boy has an accident in town and he dies. And the little girl with the magic power is um, traumatized when she can't bring him back to life. And suddenly her power goes away and the town is thrust into chaos. Part of the town thinks we should keep treating her the way we, we have been, and the other half thinks we should give her a break. And so a civil war begins amongst friends and neighbors. Yeah. Um, the story how you came to this film is quite interesting, mm -hmm. because it wasn't planned. Tell me about it. Yeah, I wasn't the original director planned for this film. Um, it had been developed by uh, writer and producer Will Woods uh, from Ontario, who had done great work on the film for seven or eight years, and uh, Albert Shin, uh, a Canadian director, was attached. He had a, an illness in his family, had to drop out, and then I got the call about four months before production began. And four months might sound like a lot to people, but when you're mounting a big movie, 
and you're just reading the script for the first time, it's a lot of planning and a lot of work. So I was just thrust into the fire because I was also busy editing Sweetland at the time. Uh, so it was a busy couple of years, but it was an exciting adventure. And I, well, I was only so lucky, you know, we, you wait for those phone calls for someone to say, we have this great script, we have a, a, a great budget, and we want you to be the guy. So. And it totally worked out. And it worked as out. you can see on the screen. Yeah. So, um, yet again, you summoned a marvelous cast. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis Fisher, for example, is playing the, mm -hmm. the grandmother Faye. Yes. Um, well, casting, I mean, the King Tide has a wonderful cast. Uh, a bunch of American actors, and then the cast is rounded up by local talent in Newfoundland. And I mean, as any, as any film director knows, cast is everything. They make your job so easy. Um, and you know, the work ideally is not in working with them once you've cast them, it's casting the right person and, and trusting that they'll do a good job. So Frances Fisher was one of the leads. People know her from Titanic and Unforgiven. Uh, she's kind of the arch villain in the film, uh, but hopefully we also understand her motivations. She's not, uh, it's not black and white. She's a gray character. I think all the characters are. We have Clayne Crawford, Aidan Young, a uh, really talented cast of, of performers that uh, I feel very lucky to have worked with. Yeah. And Alex West Leffler, mm -hmm. who plays the Isla, she's incredible. And you found her within the first couple of takes. Yeah, so the young actress playing Isla, Alex West Leffler, is a, again a Canadian actor. Um, we put out a casting call, again, nationwide, finding the right child, because child, good child actors are not easy to find. And I actually saw Alex within the first five to ten tapes that I watched. But you often feel like it's your job as a director to watch a hundred tapes and only number 99 is going to be the one and it's because of the effort you put into watching. But that's not true. Uh, so when I first watched her, I, I didn't think much of her uh, and went through all the tapes, wasn't happy and so I re-watched them and the second time I saw her, she jumped off the screen. I was like, oh my God, she's been here the whole time. And uh, you know, she's gone on to be, she's a real star on the rise. She's been in some big Hollywood movies and uh, she's continuing to She'll be busier than all of us in, in no time. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Um, the festival in my hometown, Hamburg, the Hamburg Film Festival, always has a soft spot for films from Quebec. Mm. So I've seen many wonderful films from that region. So it's good to see finally see some other region of of Canada, but Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell me a little about about the film community there? How big is it, and how many films are produced there every? Yeah, the film community in Newfoundland and Labrador is really burgeoning right now. It's coming into its own. Um, but that's only happened probably in the past 15 years. There was a couple of television shows that in particular went national. Republic of Doyle was one show. Hudson and Rex was another show. And these received national funding from the Canadian Broadcast Corporation. And so they're streamed into homes across the country. And they're both in syndication around the world now as well. So that starts to build an industry. You have people who work on series of television for five, ten years. And suddenly you have a qualified crew. You don't have to bring your crew in from away. And so, you know, while that was happening, myself and a couple of other independent filmmakers were scrappily making short films ourselves and kind of, you know, teaching ourselves. And with the internet in the past 10 years and, and going to film, I went to film school, but with the internet as well, there's so much information out there to learn from other filmmakers and tutorials online. So everyone's skill level around the world, I think, is, is getting better, certainly technically. And so the combination of the TV production and independent filmmakers like myself, Newfoundland filmmaking is really on the rise. And what, what is the size compared to like Quebec? Uh, it's still fairly small compared to Quebec just because the population is small. You know, there's 500,000 people in Newfoundland as a whole, but in, in St. John's, the capital where all the activity is, there's only about 220,000 people. Um, but there's three, uh, three or four annual TV shows uh, that, that, that go year round. Um, you know, there's usually four or five features that come out. Um, you know, the one King Tide is the biggest feature I think to ever come out of Newfoundland and it's been playing acro across the world. So slowly we're getting bigger. I mean, Disney's Peter Pan and Wendy shot uh, a bunch of uh, the content in Newfoundland. Um, the Apple TV show directed by Ben Stiller called Severance, which is very interesting. That shot part of this season in Newfoundland, same town where we shot um, King Tide. So Ben Stiller is stealing from, <laughs> stealing from us. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to ask 
all of my guests a hypothetical question. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you have a budget or having limited time to film, I think it's mostly it's good for a film because at some points you have to get creatively challenged. Mm -hmm. But would you have done anything different in, in these two films if you had, let's say, unlimited time, endless money? Or would it still be the same film? No, they'd be, if I had more time and money, the films would be different. Um, I feel satisfied with them in a way. Like, the film is a strange alchemy. Um, you have a plan and then you have reality. And the film meets somewhere in the middle. And it's beautiful for what it is. But with Sweetland in particular, we had a million dollars and 18 days to shoot. That's not much time. And so there's many scenes that are like single takes where people come up to me and say, oh, I loved it. It was one single take. It was long. It was great. And whereas reality, it was like there was 40 minutes left in the day. We hadn't even started lighting the set. Uh, so it's just, a, it's just a, a reality of having no time. Uh, and what time buys you more than anything is coverage. And when you can shoot from multiple angles, you can really push and pull the edit. Uh, whereas when you can't do that, you just have all very limited coverage. The film has to be edited a certain way. And so there was moments when Sweetland where I would like to expand more, speed things up, but I couldn't because I didn't have the coverage to do that. But that's okay. I'm still very proud of it for what it is. And, uh, you know, in my experience, when you make a film in the first year after, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not happy. And then four or five years go by and you look at it again, you're like, it's not so bad. <laughs> I think the film is perfect the way oh, it is. You. I wouldn't change anything. Oh, I really, you. really enjoyed both of them. Mm. So now we have to find a German distributor. Yes. So Yes, exactly, we do. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be working on that. Yes. So let's finish up with a look into the future. Is there anything you can already talk about? Any new projects on the horizon? Yes, actually. The, um, I, I know, uh, I mean, we'll see what happens, but I know the next two or three films that I'm aiming towards making. I already have one script written by the same author who wrote Sweetland. Uh, we wrote an original film. It's a folk horror movie in 1800s Newfoundland about conjoined twins uh, and uh, who have an unhealthy relationship. And uh, uh, when one of them, when they're separated, they enact revenge on the town and their parents. Uh, so it's a very dark kind of fable, but beautiful. I'm excited about that. Um, I'm adapting a David Adams Richards novel called Mary Sear, which is very ambitious. That's the most ambitious project I've done. It's most easily comparable to like Steven Soderbergh's Traffic. It takes place in Mexico. Uh, there's three different storylines that interweave with politics, religion, and, uh, and, and kind of social injustice, uh, following multiple points of view. Uh, and I also want to do a, uh, a basketball movie set in the 90s about three brothers over the course of one weekend. And it has all the music that I listened to in that era and all the pop culture references from the early 90s, like Nirvana and Pearl Jam. And it's like the Michael Jordan era. And it's, so it's like a real, I'm aiming for like a Dazed and Confused, but in the 90s with basketball and that kind of grunge scene. Wow. It's, everything sounds so interesting. I'm yeah, really looking you. forward. Yeah, I thank hope you. I can see that one day. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for the interview. Yeah, of thank course. Thank you very much for the for visiting Emden. Yes, well, I mean, thank you for chatting today. And I mean, Ed Zard and uh, uh, Birgit and the whole team have been have been just wonderful. I think uh, Europeans really know how to treat their guests well. They put a lot of effort into making you feel comfortable. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. Especially here in Emden. It's a yeah. wonderful festival. And I love it. I keep coming back every single day. Yeah, time, me so. too. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. And, Thanks. Uh, see you next time. Good. Sweet. Wonderful. Yeah. Lovely.